morning to everyone and welcome to the Well Here at STSA. Happy Father's Day to all the fathers in the room or those who have fathers. We're happy to, that you're joining us here today. And with all my due respect to Peter and Danny, let me give you a real dad joke, okay? Okay, because I've been a dad longer than these guys combined. And let me tell you a real corny dad joke because it's kind of my thing I do every year on Father's Day. I start with a joke, okay? So don't steal my thunder right here. Once upon a time, there was a man and his wife and they decided to take a trip to the Holy Land, to Jerusalem. And they had been excited about this trip for so long, and they have been planning for this trip, and they couldn't wait to go on this trip. Husband just wanted to get his wife and go away on this trip and enjoy the time together. And then the mother-in-law says that she wants to come too. Okay, and the, father, the husband wasn't so much of a fan of the mother-in-law. You know, she's, is my mother-in-law here today? I don't think she is. So he's, you know... You know how mother-in-law can be, and she's kind of nagging on him, and she's always giving him a hard time, and nothing's too good and good enough for her baby. And ah, 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 ah. But she says that she's coming, and her daughter, okay, his wife, can't say no to mom, so mom comes tagging along the trip. And everywhere they go on the trip, you know, the husband says, let's go out here, and the mom, mother-in-law says, no, let's go here. The mother-in-law wins. Okay, let's go to this activity. No, let's go here. And then the mother-in-law, so he's just, she's just driving him crazy. As it turns out, she has an accident, and the mother-in-law dies in Jerusalem. She dies while they're on the trip. Okay, and the husband's kind of secretly happy, but he can't say that because his wife, as you can imagine, is an absolute mess, and how can this be? And this is the worst thing ever, and then she's just crushed, and you can imagine why. While they're making the arrangements, okay, she's in no condition to do the arrangements, so he's kind of dealing with the arrangements and the funeral and the burial and all that kind of stuff. They tell him. They said, we could ship the body back to America. But it's going to be quite expensive. To do the funeral in America, you're going to pay more than $5,000 to ship the body back. They said, how much would it cost to do it right here? They said, 150 bucks. He thought about it for a little bit. And he said, $5,000. I'll ship her back to America. Ship her back. And the mortician was kind of confused. And then the wife came in, and she said, oh, thank you. And that means so much to me. And I knew you always loved her. And I knew she meant so much. And I'm so happy that I mean so much to you. And thank you, thank you, thank you. And then she leaves. And the mortician was like, I thought she drove you crazy. Why is it you going to pay $5,000 to ship her back? He said, look, while we're here on the trip, they told me about a man died here 2,000 years ago, and on the third day he rose again. I cannot take that chance here. <laughs> <laughs> Welcome to part three in our series called Happy where as you see by the logo up there on the screen, we are turning happiness upside down. We are going through the most famous sermon ever given by our Lord Jesus Christ called the Sermon on the Mount. And he began that sermon by saying eight ways to be happy. Okay, they're called the Beatitudes. They're all the blessed are statements. Okay, blessed are those who this or blessed are those who that. But we talked about in week one of this series is that the word blessed can also be translated happy. Okay, it's the Greek word makarios. And the way that word is defined, it doesn't mean happy in the way that we think of happy, which is very short term, which is very circumstantial. It's based on the stuff that happens to me. So my team wins the game, I'm happy. Okay, that's not this kind of happy. This kind of happy is a self-sufficient happiness. The kind of happiness that is there regardless of the exterior, the external circumstances. So when my boss is nice to me or my boss is mean to me, when I get a promotion or I get a demotion, when I get the good diagnosis or I get the bad diagnosis, it's an internal, self-sufficient, free from all circumstances, happiness that endures forever. That's the kind of happiness that Jesus had. Jesus had a happy life, even though he had a very difficult life. And his happiness was not because of his circumstances, but in spite of them. And what we're going to do is we're going to trust that he's going to share with us in this passage the secret to that happiness. And we're going to trust that the same way, if we do as he did, we will live as he lived. So if we can follow the path that he's laid out for us on how to live a happy life, then we will experience the same happiness that he experienced. And as you see up there with the logo, as I said a minute ago, it's happiness upside down because it's the opposite of what you think. We think happiness is when I have more. But Jesus said in these eight statements, upside down thinking, opposite of what we normally think kind of ways to get to happy. The first week for those who were here two weeks ago was blessed or happy are the poor in spirit. And we said, no, it's not poor who are happy, you should be rich. But Jesus said, no, it's actually those not who are strong, not who have all the abilities, but it's those who are humble and know they can do nothing. And we gave the three steps to be poor in spirit. It was, it was poor in spirit meant at, or admit that you need help, 
ask God for that help, and then accept the help that God sends from others. And then last week, we did blessed are those who mourn, okay? And blessed are those who mourn was really upside down because we think that we should have happy and comfort. But what, 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 what Jesus said, it's actually, it's not when you escape the trials that you find happiness, but when you embrace them, okay? It's not through escaping the pain, but embracing it is the only path to receive comfort from above. Today, Matthew chapter 5, verse 8, up there on the screen, you see it says, blessed or happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We're going to talk about purity today, and I'm talking about purity, and all of a sudden, right off the bat, you're saying, impossible, Father Anthony. It is impossible in the world that we live in today to live pure, purity. I mean, that's something that went out with like the 1950s. As soon as the phones and the iPads and all that stuff came, there's no way to be pure. Man, every TV show, man, every movie has a sex scene. Man, every commercial is selling sex. Man, you can't even go to the grocery store with my, with my son. I can't even go to the grocery store without checking up the line and seeing five ways to improve my sex life and which celebrity got abducted by an alien having a baby with who and whatnot. Man, sex is everywhere. So how in the midst of all that is it possible to live pure? The key to this verse, just like when we saw two weeks ago, blessed are the poor in spirit. It's a qualifier. It's not just poor. Poor in spirit. Same thing here. When he says pure, he's talking about pure in heart. So I'll say right off the bat, then I'll kind of unpack this, is purity is not the same as perfection. Purity is not the same as perfection. I say blessed are the pure, and automatically we as human beings, we think of an earthly, a temporal, like a sensory kind of purity, which I'm not saying is not important. It is important. We think of the words that we say, the websites that we browse, the music we listen to, and all that is super important. I'm not saying that's not important. All I'm saying is that's not what Jesus is talking about here. There's more to it. Just like a doctor, okay, you go to a doctor. A doctor, you can tell him, my back hurts. He's not going to talk about your back until he first checks your pulse, right? They have to do the vitals. They have to check your pulse and, you know, the blood pressure and the thing in the ear, whatever it may be. They have to do all that stuff. So you say, my back, I'm not here for my heart, but, but we can't really talk about your back until we make sure your heart is okay. Jesus is kind of the same way. That Jesus starts at the heart and then works outward. We start outward in, Jesus goes inside out. Look at this verse right here from Matthew chapter 15, verse 16 to 20. Are you also still without understanding? Do you not understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and is eliminated? But those things which proceed out of the mouth come from the heart, and they are what defile a man. For out of the heart proceed evil thoughts, murders, adulteries, fornications, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. These are the things which defile a man, but to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. You see, like I said, a doctor knows that no matter what's going on in your body, if your heart isn't working right, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter your back, your elbow, your shoulder. That doesn't matter. If your heart has a blockage or your heart isn't functioning, then none of that other stuff matters. Well, Jesus is saying the same stuff right here spiritually. When he talk about the heart in the scriptures, the heart is considered the epicenter of man, the center, the headquarters of man, from which flow his intentions, his motivations, his emotions, everything about a man, his desires, that's all embodied in the heart. And what Jesus says is, I need that to be pure, because if that ain't pure, then nothing else matters right here. And because that area is so important, just like I said, a doctor, Jesus tells us, the scriptures tell us, we need to pay special attention to the heart. Watch this verse right here. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 23. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it spring the issues of life. Issues of life. You got any issues in your life? Your life has any issues? Maybe your issue is like jealousy. No one likes to admit they're a jealous person. No one considers himself a jealous person. No one wants to be that jealous, envious person. But there's just something strange that every time, and we don't like to admit this because this is issues. We don't like to admit this, but something strange. Something good happens to her. I get a little bit bothered. And something bad happens to her. I get a little bit happy. Man, we don't admit that stuff. We don't admit that stuff. But it's, sometimes it's there issues of life. Maybe your issue is anxiety. 
And maybe you've been anxious, anxious, anxious for so long, anxious day, anxious night, anxious at work, anxious about everything, anxious, anxious, anxious. For you, anxiety isn't like an issue, it's like a pet, okay? Like you feel like it's just, it lives in your house with you, you give it a name, your anxiety. And then you hear a verse that Jesus says, do not worry about tomorrow. And you're like, what is that? Is that an outer space verse? Because that cannot be a real verse. Because there's no such thing as a life without worry. Maybe that's your issue. Maybe your issue is an anger issue, an impatience issue. Maybe your issue is you love your children so much, so much. You will do anything for your children, but you just cannot stop from going crazy on them when they make a mistake. You love them, you will give your life for them, but just somehow they push your buttons and they make you explode. What is all that? That's issues of life. And what the scripture is telling us here is the issues of life come from the heart. So therefore, we need to pay special attention to our heart. There's only two kinds of people in this world. There's only two kinds of people. There's some people who have issues in their heart and they know about it. And there's other people who are blind to it. But there ain't no person in this world who doesn't have some issues coming out of his life and the center of them is from his heart. That's why. What is the opposite of pure in heart? The opposite of pure in heart is not like sexual and lust and, and, and desires. That's not the opposite of pure in heart. The opposite of pure in heart is hypocrisy, is double-mindedness, is someone who doesn't know who they really are, who walks around saying, I'm this, but their behavior says this, who thinks of themselves as this, but their actions say this. And they think in the mirror what they see is this, but everyone around them knows that's not who they are. Pure in heart, the opposite is not sexual desires. The opposite is a hypocrite. And hypocrite, the word in, in, in the Greek that, that's translated hypocrite, literally was the word that used to describe an actor. The way they used to do plays back then, they wouldn't have like costumes and so many actors. It'd be like four actors playing like 10 parts. So here I am and I would wear a mask, okay? And then I'd be acting like, you know, Joe the plumber. Then I'd go off stage and grab a different mask. And then I'd be, you know, his cousin Eddie or whatever it may be. So the same actor, but with different masks. That's what hypocrite was. Hypocrite was someone who was double-minded, double-faced, didn't know who he really was. And I'm telling you, that exists a lot more than we realize. No one will admit about themselves. But there's a lot more of us that are blind to our true state than we may realize. And I'll give you an example. I'll give you an example. Raise your hand. Let's do a raise your hand game. No looking around, but raise your hand. If you know somebody, if you know somebody who thinks they're funny, but they're not really that funny. <laughs> Raise your hand. Okay, very good. Hands up all over the place. I got no pointing, no elbows necessary, okay? <laughs> you know somebody, okay, who thinks they're funny and they're not, okay? We won't do any more hands because this could get kind of ugly right here, okay? But how many know somebody who thinks they're very stylish and thinks they're like cutting edge, you know what I mean, and the pants high and the hair and the whatnot maybe, and then you just laughing at them like, yeah. Okay, how many know somebody especially for Father's Day, an older guy who thinks he's still the young, cool guy. You know what I mean? And he likes to, to laugh with the young whippersnappers. Okay, someone proudly, that's right. That's us, that's right, that's me, very good. Look, I, I can't believe this is true. I'm about to say what I'm about to say. You're not gonna believe this. This is shocking what I'm about to say is I just discovered that in my son's world, my son is now 14 years old. My son somehow thinks that I'm not cool anymore. Like, I don't know, I don't know how this happened. Okay, he just graduated eighth grade and they had this pool party at, after the graduation. And I, I, I had, we have to like do the hours of chaperoning or whatever it may be. And of course we never do our hours. So we have to look for the things at the end. So I haven't chaperoned the pool party. And I'm like, okay, this is great. Like, you know, I got some new jokes I want to test out. Like I'm, I'm going to be in the pool with the kids. We're going to be playing games. I'm going to be like testing sermon material. And my son gave me specific instructions who I am allowed to and not allowed to speak to. And which parts of the pool I'm allowed to go. And I'm like, no, Michael, that's for the old guy dads. That's, that's, not, that's not me, okay? And my wife just, you know, <laughs> thank you. We all know somebody, we may be somebody, who thinks one thing about themselves, but the reality may be different. King David in Psalm 15 says, Lord, who may abide in your tabernacle? Who may dwell in your holy hill? It is he who walks uprightly and works righteousness and speaks the truth in his heart. Here's what we're going to do today, ladies and gentlemen. Today, I'm going to challenge you to do a spiritual EKG, do a spiritual heart examination. We're going, to, we're going to go inside, and I'm going to challenge you to see what the issues are and what the source of those issues is. And the same way 
that if I serve you a plate of food, you would not accept any impurity in that food. If I give you a glass of water, you would not accept impurity in the water. We would not accept impurity in the air we breathe. We do not accept impurity in everything that comes to us in life. We will not accept impurity in our hearts. I'm not saying we know what we're going to do about it, but we're at least not going to accept it and say, well, that's just the way it is. We don't accept impurity in our hair, in our clothes, in our teeth, on our face. We don't accept impurity when someone scratches our car. Man, we are not going to allow any impurity in our hearts because that area can be deadly. In the same way, back to the doctor example, you can eat the organic, okay, and you can do, you know, the, the, the fresh whatever and make your own meal, and you can do all that funny stuff. In the end, if you've got a heart blockage, hey, none of that stuff, it doesn't matter whether it's organic, not organic, it doesn't matter how much you paid for it. If you've got a blockage in your heart, none of it matters. Same spiritually. You can read the Bible, you can pray, you can go to church all you want. You do that for year after year after year after year. If you've got a blockage in your heart and you are not pure in your heart, all the prayer, all the Bible, all the service, all the everything that you do, it's not going to get you anywhere. And unfortunately, looking back on life, many of us can look back and see regrets. Things that we wish hadn't happened. Relationships that we wish hadn't broken. Bridges that we wish hadn't burned. And we can look back on it today and say, you know what? If I had known my heart back then, things might be different. So we want to catch it on the front end. We don't want to wait to burn the bridge. We don't want to wait for the relationship to grow apart. We don't want to wait for there to be so many problems that we can no longer fix them. We want to be proactive, and we want to see three ways. Okay, I'm going to challenge you to three ways that you challenge, and I'm sorry, that you examine your heart and make sure that it is pure. And since it's Father's Day, all this gear towards Father's. So I'm going to tell you, there's going to be three ways I'm going to spend more time on the first one than the last two because I know the dads that calculate. So if you spent, you know, like 10 minutes on point one and start to do the math, it's going to be forever until we get out of here. I'm telling you right up front. Point number one, going to take a lot more time. Point two and three, I'll catch you up. Kind of like the airplane. No matter how much I take on the front end, we always land at the same time. Okay, so don't you worry, dads. Three ways to know your heart. Number one, diagnose my heart with brutal honesty. I must diagnose my heart with brutal honesty. First step, I got to pop the hood and see what's going on inside the engine. And I need to be brutally honest. Do you want to know what the number one problem, in my opinion, in life is today? Do you want to know, in my opinion, my opinion, you take it for what it's worth. My opinion, problems in marriage. Do you want to know where a majority of them come from? Problems in relationship between fathers and sons or mothers and daughters or whatever it may be. Do you want to know where it comes from? Problems, even in our relationship with God. Do you want to know where it comes from? I believe it is lack of self-awareness. I believe that's the number one problem that kills relationships and kills our lives. It's not that the problem is so bad, but as long as we are not aware of what is going on inside, we will continue to be slowly killed by it until we figure it out. Self-awareness. Now, I, used to, I say to you self-awareness, and you're like, that's easy. I know myself. Man, I've been living with myself my whole life. No one knows me better than me. Are you sure about that? You know, exactly. it's exactly the opposite. Okay, it's not, it's not the longer that you've been with someone, the more you know them. Sometimes the longer you've been is the more blind you are to the spots. Like everyone knows somebody. Everyone knows, I hope not, but there's this, I, I still remember, like there's this house we used to go to when I was young. It smelled like my feet, okay? It smelled, it smelled, it smelled, it smelled. And we would go in there and I want to just scream, how are you people living like this? Like how, crack a window, like somebody, call the fireman, like anybody, do something. But they couldn't smell it. They couldn't smell it because the principle in all of life, time in erodes awareness of. That's the principle. Time in erodes awareness of. The longer you're in the house, the less you can sense that it smells. The longer that you're in any situation in the office, the less you can see that that picture just ain't 100% right. The more time you spend in something, okay, like the expression goes, a fresh set of eyes. We need to go into our hearts with a fresh set of eyes and not assume that we know anything about ourselves. Because what I believe is that with time, stories develop in our brains. Things go wrong in our hearts. Like, for example, let me tell you some stories that may be going on in your heart. Some of the stories that may be is that everyone around me is crazy. Everyone around me is stupid. Everyone around me is ignorant. No one's as smart as I am. I got it all figured out. And because that's your story in your head, that no one around you can match you, you justify being rude, being arrogant, 
that's stepping on people because no one matches your elite level. That's your story that's in your head and you're not aware of it. Maybe some of us, our story is that we're a victim, that we haven't been treated fairly. And life has never been fair to me. From when I was young to when I was in college to when I graduated school, life hasn't been fair to me. So you justify kind of the end justifies the means and you cut corners and you take shortcuts and you do things that you wouldn't normally justify, allow others to justify, but you give yourself a pass because life hasn't been fair to you. Maybe your story is that no one ever respected me. No one respected me growing up. No one respects me in my job. No one respects me at home. So you're always trying to prove yourself. And you're always trying to accomplishments and trying to get degrees. And you always want to be the first in the line because you're trying to prove that you're worthy of respect. That's your story going on. And as long as you're not aware of it, you will justify all kinds of behavior because you're blind to it. Let me give you some areas that you can look at okay, when challenging, when looking and examining your heart, when diagnosing. Okay, we'll go through words, attitudes, and then uh, uh, actions, and then intentions. So first, let's start with our words. With your words, look for complaining and criticizing. Measure your words and ask yourself the words that come out of my mouth because they're a reflection of the heart. Complaining and criticizing. The why him? The why not me? The I deserve better. That this guy stinks. That this person doesn't know what they're doing. A lot of those words would reflect the fact that something's not right in the heart. How about attitudes? Attitudes, watch out for cynical and critical. Cynical and critical. Cynical and critical, easy to judge. Easy to be offended. You know the easily offended guy? Okay, watch out if you're easily offended by everything and anyone says, you're almost looking to be offended. You're almost looking for someone to justify some kind of anger towards. Be careful if your attitude, the cynical attitude, oh, that won't work. Someone says something in the staff meeting, oh, that'll never work. Oh, that's a dumb idea. And then you find yourself sabotaging other people's ideas to prove that they're wrong. Actions, compromising. Be careful when you stand strong on your moral ground and all of a sudden you take little steps that you would have never taken before. That's not that big a deal. Little lies, little cheats, little steals. But we can even call it stealing. Little, little steps towards, you know, a, a, a problematic relationship. But you know, it's not that big a deal. Like I would never have said, little steps, be careful. Every big catastrophe started with little steps. And if you find yourself compromising and then rationalizing, be careful. It could be a problem in your heart. Last one, not the actions, but the intentions. How do you ju- judge your intentions? Well, let me tell you a little question. I heard this one time, maybe five years ago and something like that. I'm telling you, this question can change your life if you learn to ask yourself this question after you do anything. Ask yourself this question after you do anything. The question is, why did I do this really? You have to ask yourself twice. You have to ask yourself, why did I do this? And then say, wait, really, why did I do this? Why did I choose to lie in this situation instead of tell the truth? No, really, why did I choose to lie? Why did I avoid inviting this person to this event? Oh, and because we're there. No, really. Why did I? Why did I get so angry when so-and-so said that? Or why didn't I get angry when so-and-so said that? Why did that make me happy? Why did that make me sad? No, really. Really. Why did that really make me so angry? Why am I getting annoyed by Father Anthony asking me all these questions right now? Why do I think this game is dumb and I don't want to play? No, really. One time, a long time ago, I found myself in a bad situation in my heart, but I didn't realize it at the time. Okay, I do like everyone else does, is you justify it and everyone else and the situation. And I found myself what I call keeping score with God. Okay, keeping score, which means like, God, I'm a priest. Man, I am breaking my back, and I'm working Saturdays, and I'm working Sundays, and I'm pushing it Monday through Friday, and I am, and I am, and I'm, I don't ask for anything, and I don't want money, and I don't want any credit, I don't want anyone to clap and say whatever it is, but God is too much. And I found myself complaining to God. Imagine that, I'm complaining to God, like, God, you don't know what you're doing. Like, God, like, I'm doing too much for God. Like, think of that one, okay? Like, God, you owe me kind of a thing, okay? Like, you created everything in the world, and I, like, you know, did something on a Sunday morning for a couple hours. So, God, you owe me. And I found myself getting kind of resentful, getting kind of bitter. And I'm still, like, I'm working, because I'm a hard, I'm working, I'm working, I'm working. But inside, man, I'm kind of resentful. And I'm kind of like, why I'm doing so much, someone else isn't doing it. And how come that person doesn't appreciate it? And how come God could have made that smooth? And I'm keeping score. And then God, one time, like a smack upside the head, 
made me realize. He said, wait a minute. Everything in your situation that you're complaining about is exactly the same as it was 10 years ago when you started this job, isn't it? And I said, yeah. The work is the same. The people are the same. The job, like everything is exactly the same. It's not like you're doing more than you were back then, but somehow back then you were happy. And somehow back then you found it a joy and you found it an honor. And even you, God telling this to me, even you, Father Anthony said, it would be my honor to be the trash man in the church. I would be honored if that was what, if the church asked me, don't preach up here on the stage, don't do any of the fancy stuff, but just take out the trash. I would have said, honestly, there was a time where I said, I would be glad to do that. I don't know, my wife would have been as happy with the salary, but I'm saying I would have been happy to do that. So God said to me, Father Anthony, what changed? You know what changed? My heart. My circumstance was the same. It was my heart that had changed. And because my heart changed, I lost happiness. And it almost ruined me. That's why I love this passage from Psalm 73. It's a guy named Asaph who says this. He says, truly God is good to Israel, to such as are pure in heart. God is good to those who are pure in heart. But as for me, this is my story right here. My feet had almost stumbled. My steps had nearly slipped, for I was envious of the boastful when I saw the prosperity of the wicked. And he goes on throughout the rest of the psalm to say, I started keeping score. And I started saying why God left me here and why this happened there and why and why and why. And then God hit me and said, you know what? Look, 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 look. I'm God. I didn't change. Your heart is what changed. And if your heart changed, you will see all of life differently. Not because life is different, but because you are different. So step number one proper diagnosis. You're not going to solve anything until you diagnose it properly. We will diagnose our heart with brutal honesty. We will ask ourselves questions like, what is the true state of my heart? What do I really want out of life? No, really. What do I want out of life? Why does this bother me? What drives me? What is it that's pushing me? Why is it that this angered me? Why is it that this didn't matter to me? We're going to ask ourselves those tough questions and we're going to be honest with our state. And then the second thing we're going to do, every step gets a little bit harder. We're going to declare that to at least one other person. We're going to diagnose, and then we're going to declare. Diagnosing the problem is very important. But you're not actually taking a step towards solving it until you share it with somebody else. I know I got an anger problem. I know I got a lust problem. I know I lack self-control. I know that I got resentful unforgiveness and bitterness. I I, I, there it is. I diagnosed it. What good is that going to do me? I need somebody to help me with it. Well, good, good for you. So Ecclesiastes chapter four, verse nine says this. Two are better than one. As we approach whatever our problem or issues, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. What do we usually do when we discover bad stuff about ourselves? When we make a mistake and, we don't, and, we, and we're not happy with who we are? We hide, right? Isn't that what Adam did in the garden? He hid, and that's what mankind always does. Our tendency is to hide, to isolate, to pull away. And the more we pull away and hide, we are playing into the hands of our enemy, whose strategy is very simple, divide and conquer. Another story. One time when I was probably eight, nine, 10 years old, something like that, we took our family vacation to the beach and I'm out there swimming in the ocean. And of course, you know, when you're like eight or nine, that's probably a little, probably let's say maybe 10, 11, something like that. I would want to go swim out in the deep part because the deep part is the fun part. But of course, my mom, okay, would have a, a conniption if I went past the knees, okay, because, ah, you know what I mean? So I just wait till she's not looking and then I go deeper, okay? And I remember one time I'm like, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm, I'm gonna show my stuff. Like I had been like studying swimming and, and, and I was watching Baywatch, okay? And I've been like, like <laughs> you know, like, like for, for, for educational purposes, okay, for educational purposes. So I'm, I, and I'm, and I'm going to go out there and I'm going to go deep. And I'm like, yeah, and I'm deep and I'm deep and I'm deep. And all of a sudden I realized, oh, Lord, I couldn't touch the ground. And I flipped out. I flipped out because everything that my mom was in my, like all that's going through my head. And I'm like, oh, no. I think I just didn't want her to be right more than anything else. I was worried about drowning. And I'm like flipping and I'm screaming and I'm flailing and help! And I'm screaming, help, help! And then my mom, of course, because she has like the radar lock, okay, from wherever she was, heard me and she's now screaming, help and help and help! And I'm out there and help and help. And then all of a sudden, as I'm out there and I'm screaming, help, back to the shore, all of a sudden, I see like a man and a woman in a raft, like in front of me, like sunbathing, okay? Like kicking back. They're a little bit deeper than me. 
And all of a sudden, I saw them. I'm like, oh, that's not that big a deal. So I gathered myself, started treading water, went back over here, and I walked back in very calmly. It just took me realizing that, you know what? I'm not alone. When you're out here by yourself, this is scary. But then they're like sipping a cold one, okay? And they're clearly not in distress by any means. And they're looking at me like a crazy person. So then all of a sudden, I'm like, you know what? I just needed to know I'm not in the boat by myself. I just needed to know I'm not out here all by myself. But once I saw somebody else, I gathered my composure and I swam back to safety. Well, I'm telling you, one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why, I'll say this now, I'll say this the day I die. One of the reasons why, it is essential. It is essential. You have no shot in life on your own. It is essential to be part of a church family, a community. Because exactly this purpose, because two are better than one. And the one is trying to do it on his own, man, good luck to you. Good luck to you. I wish you all the best of luck. But man, for me, I don't have the option. I, I, I can't do it on my own. I need this. Because I'll tell you what. If you see me, you go outside here today, and you see me face first in a ditch. How many people? Raise your hand if you're just going to walk by and say, not my problem. Anybody? See me face down and be like, thank God it's not me. You know, he had that coming for that story he told about his mother-in-law. Like, you know. <laughs> no. You see me down, you're going to pick me up. Well, the same is true spiritually. And I'm going to pick you up. And the same thing spiritually. If we see each other down, man, we pick each other up. That's what church is. I see you struggling, I'm there, you're there, and you're there. That's what church is all about. And the one who tries to do it by himself, man, good luck to you. We need to diagnose our problem. And then we need to share that problem and say, I need help. And what you're going to realize is you're not the only one. We're all in the same boat. We all look good on the outside. We're our Sunday best today, but all of us are a mess on the inside. All of us are broken. All of us have pride. All of us struggle with envy. All of us, all of us, all of us struggle. And until you learn to share, man, good luck to you by yourself. The rest of that verse goes like this. Though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. That's what it means to be part of the church. Okay, first step was diagnose. Second step is declare. Third step is delight. Delight yourself in the Lord. And I know this is a difficult expression. Let me explain what this means. The expression delight yourself in the Lord comes from a, P, a, a verse in scripture from the Psalms. It's Psalm, 70, or Psalm, Psalm 37, verse four, which says this. It says, delight yourself also in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. Oftentimes people misquote this verse. Oftentimes what I hear people say is, wait on the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. I think my wife is actually the one who originally made up that misquote, okay? Wait on the Lord. It doesn't say wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord sounds like, okay, hurry up, God. And that's not what this verse says. This verse says, delight yourself in the Lord. What does the word delight mean? It doesn't mean hurry up, God. Delight yourself. Okay, the word literally, okay, the word that's translated here from the Hebrew, it literally means to become soft or pliable, delicate with enjoyment. Soft or pliable, delicate with enjoyment. So let me show you, draw you, I'll draw you a word picture, then I'll show you a physical picture. You know what it means to delight in another person? Think of that engaged couple. You know, the one that you can't stand. The one that's, The one that sits, I hope I'm getting myself in serious trouble here. You know when you go to the restaurant, okay, you're in the restaurant, the subway or whatever it may be, and they're sitting on the same side? That couple. They're like, come on, this is not mathematically, ge geometrically accurate. Like one here, one here. That couple that just wants to like, you know, dip my fries in your ketchup or whatever. Like, you know that? That like they talk funny and they walk funny and they think about the world funny and nothing matters. And, ah. That delight yourself in the Lord. It means somebody <clears throat> who is head over heels, delighting in the other person. You know, love will keep us alive. You know what I'm saying? Like that kind of a person. And what this verse says is that should be our attitude towards God. We should delight ourselves in him. And if we do, we will desire nothing outside of him. And we will find true happiness. Let me show you a picture. 
And this picture, I've shown you this picture before. It is the perfect picture to show you what does it mean to delight in another person and not need anything else outside. Thank you very much. Right on cue come the alls. Hey, it's Father's Day, so I'll be as sappy as I want to be. This is my girl. This is Lizzie back several years ago before she was a teenager and talked back, okay? <laughs> I love this picture because this picture to me is my beautiful daughter delighting in her dad. In this picture, she needs nothing. Like same girl that, you know, a minute ago, I want this toy, or I want the iPad, or I want the phone, or I'm hungry, or this stinks, or I want to, ah, right there, there, in that, in that picture? What do you need, Lizzie? Nothing. You happy? I'm happy. Anything I can do for you? No. Nah. But you don't got an iPad? I don't got an iPad. You don't got a phone. The, mo- the meatloaf's still the meatloaf, like it didn't change. But I got my dad, and I'm delight in his arms. I believe that every soul, every human being right here, every single one by your name, everyone by your name, your greatest desire in life is to be this with God. I believe God created us with a longing to delight in him and to be in his arms. St. Augustine of Hippo once said that our souls, Lord, are restless till they rest in you. And I believe that is true about every single one of us, that until we find rest in the arms of our heavenly father, we'll never truly be happy never truly be satisfied. And the truth is, that's kind of where we started off, isn't it? Like we kind of started this spiritual journey with, yeah, I just want you, God. But then other stuff creeps in our heart. Like somehow it was all about God, but now all of a sudden there's like this, well, I kind of want to be successful. Where'd that desire for success come? Then I kind of want to be like respected. And and, and I kind of want a bigger house. And I kind of want so-and-so to not be as successful. And all of a sudden, our pure heart, which only desired to delight in the Lord, that's all our heart desired in the beginning. It was pure. I only want you, God. I don't want anything else. But all these little defilements creep into our heart. And today, Father's Day, ladies and gentlemen, today, we got to clean that stuff out. We got to get rid of anything that's inside there that is apart from delighting in the arms of our Heavenly Father. Ask yourself, your relationship with God. Like this picture with Lizzie? I didn't bring you a picture of the teenage version, okay? Like, she's not a teenager yet, but you can compare this to the teenage version. Right? Just go back to your own childhood when you were a teenager. Where the, where, where the young child with God, and whatever God, I love you, God, or where the teenager, I need this, and I need this, and I need this, God. Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. Blessed or happy are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. I believe I'm a father. It is my greatest desire to see my children in my arms happy. I will take care of everything that they need. They come to me, pure heart, just want you, Dad. Nothing within my capabilities I won't do for my children. I am. Please do not think that I am a better father than God. Please, I'm not saying I'm a bad father. I think I'm a pretty good father. But please, I just told you my intention for my kids. Do not think for one second that I am a better father than God in heaven. And if I desire to give my kids the happiness and the fulfillment and everything that they desire, then how much? Our heavenly father. But you got to take away anything that's in the way. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Pure in heart is not about perfection, like I said in the beginning. Pure in heart, I heard it once nicely. Pure in heart is not about the marks that are on the board. It's not about the number of marks. Pure in heart means who does the board belong to? And regardless of how many marks, as long as that board belongs to God, we'll take care of the marks. So each one of us, our challenge for today is we examine our hearts. We diagnose, we declare, we delight in the Lord, and then we trust that God will not leave us hanging, that he, it is his greatest desire to give us that happiness. Let's stand together for a prayer. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, amen. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you from the bottom of our hearts for all that you are and all that you've done for us. 
Lord, if we started counting all the blessings that you poured in our lives, we'd be here all day and all night. I pray, Lord, that you would help us to clean our hearts, that you would remove from us, Lord, anything that's like selfish or me or my, that you would reveal all that stuff to us, Lord, and that we get rid of that stuff. Help us to only seek you and help us to truly delight in you. And let us return to that purity of heart like a child in their father's arms. We pray these things in the name of your son, the intercessions and prayers of all your saints. Here as we pray thankfully. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.